Hi, this is Elliot Axelman from the Liberty Block. Check us out on libertyblock.com and live every week at 7 p.m. on Thursday evenings. Always principled, always libertarian. Welcome to the Liberty Block. I'm Elliot Axelman. We have a ton to go over, and we're going to try to be done before 8 p.m. If you've noticed that the past two weeks, the quality of the video and the audio is fantastic compared to what we've had in the past for the past four weeks, it's because we have Michael over here doing a whole massive production with some incredible cameras and some great sound equipment. He can't be here every week because he comes from Connecticut. But if you guys do love the quality and I'm loving the upgrade, we'll put our Patreon link there after the show. And that way we can donate and everything you guys donate, if you feel so inclined, will go towards trying to get Michael to come back here every week because it is quite the schlep from Connecticut and to set up all this equipment. Fantastic. more minutes all right we have a lot of great news as far as libertarian candidates with the libertarian party and and with other parties gary johnson presidential nominee for the libertarian party in 2016 has announced that he is going to run for senate in new mexico of course he won two terms as a governor in new mexico which is a two-to-one democrat state he won as a republican twice had fantastic approval ratings in new mexico one of the few governors, maybe the only governor in history of the U.S., to cut the budget, cut spending, cut the size of government, finish with surpluses. I think he had a billion-dollar surplus in New Mexico. So he's incredibly popular in New Mexico and throughout the country. And he decided to run as a libertarian for U.S. Senate from New Mexico. Now, that's a campaign that has a fantastic shot to win, of course. We have Larry Sharp a friend of mine from Queens back when we were both in Queens and the Libertarian Party, and he's running for governor of New York, which I think is fantastic because we have Cuomo who's running for his third term because New York does not have any term limits. He's been governor since 2010, and he's running for his third term now, and he's been horrible, horrible, horrible for New York, one of the absolute worst, most socialist, authoritarian governors in the country. Larry Sharp is running, and there will be a Republican and the Republican will be a typical New York Republican, which is essentially a Democrat. So the only pro-liberty candidate, the only candidate who cares about our freedoms for the voters of New York is going to be Larry Sharp. He's been making incredible progress for our campaign. If he were like every other libertarian running for governor around the country, to be honest, I wouldn't talk about him. He's been making appearances all around the state. I think he's going to hit every city and every town in the state. From, from northern New York, central New York, western New York, by Buffalo, downstate New York, Long Island, Hudson Valley, everywhere. He's been everywhere. I think he was in Yonkers the other day. He was upstate the other day. He's also getting incredible media. He's getting on local TV and radio and news, and he's doing events in, in local businesses. And it was just announced, I think, yesterday that he's going to be on Fox Business with Kennedy, who has a libertarian show every night, 8 p.m., and then a rerun again at like midnight or something. Uh, Lisa Kennedy is a libertarian. The kind of people she has on her show are Napolitano, the judge, uh, Ron Paul once in a while, I think. Austin Peterson's been on there, I, I believe, a few times. I'm sure John Stossel's been on there. So Larry Sharp is going to be on there at 8 p.m., so we need to be done by 8 p.m. Elliot, yep. we have our anonymous guest. Great, great. Yeah, he, he, he could jump on in anytime. Now, hopefully, I would hear him. Um... I don't know that we have that technology just yet. You are correct. <laughs> so we're going to try to figure something out. But you'll hear him, so that's all right. Just um, let me know if I have to shut up. Excellent. So we also have some great candidates in New Hampshire in the Libertarian Party running. We have two great candidates running for the gubernatorial nomination, and we have a bunch of candidates running for representative, at least a few of which are fantastic candidates who should get elected. Over the next few months before November, leading up to the elections, to have on as many great libertarian candidates, especially those running in the Libertarian Party, the only party of principle in the state. We're going to try to have as many of them on as possible as guests on the show. Now, on to some juicy headlines from around the country. Before you get to those yeah. headlines, our guest would like to chime in. Sure. I'm not hearing his audio, unfortunately. That's all right. Nothing? Nope. That's all right. 
So in in one of the most amazing things I've heard as a libertarian who wants to get rid of, of just about every person in government position throughout the country, the entire Supreme Court of West Virginia has been impeached by the House of Delegates in Virginia, and they will be removed pending the state Senate holding hearings for each individual one going forward. So the entire West Virginia, the, the five justices, I believe, might totally be removed, and then they'll need special elections to fill those spots. So that's fantastic. Why were they removed? Why were they impeached by the House of Delegates? Apparently, they've been corrupt, all of them, spending hundreds of thousands or millions, perhaps, on on redecorating their offices with couches, upwards of $30,000 for couches or desks, and, and it's, it's disgusting, and it's corruption. And it's What's more surprising than the corruption is that, is that the government body, the House of Delegates, which, which is the state house in Virginia, actually voted to impeach them, which is incredible. I wonder when was the last time that's happened. Some more awesome news, more gloating, boasting on my part, is remember a few months ago at the uh, net neutrality? And we had the, the whole left in America saying that if net neutrality is repealed, which was only put into place during the Obama administration a few years prior, they said if net neutrality regulations on net providers, on the internet providers, if that was repealed, if the FCC no longer regulated the speed of the internet providers, then then the world would collapse and the internet would, would cease to exist as we know it, and we'd be uh, having our internet slow down, we'd be charged all kinds of money, and, and we'd, we'd uh, have to pay per per time we do anything on the internet, every time we loaded a page, you'd have to pay money. That's what the left was saying. There's an interesting article here from the, the dailycaller.com saying that apparently since net neutrality was repealed a few months ago, the internet speed in the U.S. has gone from 12th fastest in the world to 6th fastest in the world, which is pretty hilarious. So I, I was I was gloating about that earlier, to be honest, even though it's, it's uh, not very honorable of me. Next thing we got to fly through is, remember Jack Phillips, owner of, I believe, uh, Masterpiece, what was the name of the bakery? Masterpiece Cake Shop. Yeah, Masterpiece Cake Shop in Colorado that went to the Supreme Court. And do you remember the specifics of the Supreme Court ruling when they ruled in favor of him? They barely ruled in favor. They ruled in favor, but not the ruling. Wasn't so good. the ruling yeah. was effectively, we weren't, we didn't like the way you were treated by in Colorado court. by the state. And yeah, so the decision itself wasn't necessarily bad. It's how you were treated in court. Yeah, so, so they didn't rule. That's the issue. So some people thought, might have thought it was a win on the surface. The Supreme Court of the U.S. ruled that Colorado treated him unfairly, and they hated Christians, which is probably true. They probably hate Christian conservatives, and they thought it was a bigot. So they treated him unfairly in the process, and that's why they ruled in favor of him, saying he wasn't compelled to bake the, the specialized, uh, specialized decorated cake for that gay couple. They, they, what the Supreme Court should have done is rule that because of freedom— because of freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom to do whatever you want in your own business. He could have done whatever he wanted, and as we know, as libertarians, as free people, we can do whatever we want. We are not compelled to do any service for anyone ever. We just don't – even if a business serves the public, it doesn't matter. That's what the Supreme Court should have ruled, but the Supreme Court did not rule that. And it's yeah, unfortunate. No one so, What's that? Yeah, yeah, no one has a right to your labor. That's what the 13th Amendment was there for. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So anyway, it, it seems like Colorado or, or a certain faction is probably purposely trying to trip them up again. And again, a, a transgender person apparently walked into the bakery shop and asked for a, a specially decorated personalized cake for, for this transgender individual who I think went from uh, male to female, I believe. And it was the seven-year anniversary of the transition. This person asked for a specialized decorated cake to celebrate that seventh anniversary. And the baker again refused. And apparently Colorado State, the the uh, department in Colorado in charge of, of the of the, the commerce or, or whatever the, the uh, protected classes are, apparently is compelling him to do it. And he's suing Colorado now. So we're going to see where that goes, and, and maybe it'll go right back to the Supreme Court, and we'll, we'll see. I don't know if you have any thoughts. Well, there was another case in Oregon about that something like this. It was a gun shop or something that refused to sell a gun to somebody because they were under 18. Oh, yeah? Yeah, in Oregon. So the, the kids— But under 18, that— The kids sued the store for refusing to sell to them. Isn't it a law that— I don't know. From what I thought was federal law, and I, I thought every state as well, is that under 18, you can't buy any firearm ever. Well, 
the point is that they quote discriminated based on yeah. age, so they have to sell. Maybe those gun. kids were like Ryan. I mean Rihanna. <laughs> Maybe those kids were just you know just trying to screw with them for for doing for what they do. Just yeah, trying, you well, know. Uh, don't get Rihanna too much into trouble here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'll tr- I'll try. So oh yeah, so I forgot to mention. Hopefully in in two weeks when he definitely has his license, her license, Ryan Rihanna, the transition. It's gonna be epic. Hopefully in two weeks from today on Thursday evening we'll have Ryan back here. He's busy today, and uh, we'll do that interview. It's gonna be epic. All right, you want to talk about the New Mexico terrorist compound? So I think we mentioned this last week, but there's an, a slightly new development. There were five uh, Muslim extremist terrorists in New Mexico who were arrested a few weeks ago now. Apparently, they had a, a compound somewhere near Albuquerque in New Mexico where they were teaching, I believe, 11 or 13 children to conduct school shootings. They were teaching them how to load and shoot AR-15s. They had all sorts of other handguns on them, and, and that's what the, the prosecutors are saying, and that's what it seems to be the case from all the, all the media. And five of them were arrested— the the uh, thirteen kids were were ranged in age from I think very young to like to uh, teens I believe, and they the was also a, a three year old who was the son of uh, what was his name Wihaj the son of of the the main one who's who himself was the son of the imam who was involved in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing apparently, so it, the main one's son Wihaj I believe, his son was the three year old was dead. Um, so there's also a potential murder charge, I believe. Anyway, these five individuals were all released on, on bail or on signature bond or, or signature bail, I heard. So without any money to even bail them out, they were all released from prison, I believe. That's what I've heard. And now they just signed saying that they're going to come back to court for their court date, which I don't know if I trust, but whatever. Anyway. So th- according yeah. to frontpagebagazine.com. Mm-hmm. New Mexico State Judge Sarah Backus on mm-hmm. Monday released five Islamic radicals mm-hmm. on a twenty thousand dollar quote signature bond, which requires no payment. Yeah, apparently they just signed, and if they don't come, they got to pay twenty grand. I think that's how it works. But the new thing that I saw the other day, because this is old news from last week, is NBC dot NBC reported that the government has mysteriously destroyed the compound. So nothing to see here. They destroyed it before you know maybe it could be investigated. So that's also a little suspicious, if you ask me. That we, we want to know what was going on at the compound, because there were apparently children being trained to conduct school shootings, which is an issue in this country. But if you ask the left, especially, it is the biggest issue plag- plaguing this country. I shared an article earlier today that I wrote about about Exeter High School in eastern New Hampshire. The, a lot of the students in the high school, the middle school as well, and the surrounding high schools were were kind of brainwashed over the past few years, I suppose, since they entered public school. I mean, government school. To they were brainwashed to hate guns and be afraid of mass shootings. And literally, you have girls reading poems. Uh, I'll post the article here as well. I wrote it when it happened a few months ago. You have girls in, in high school, middle school, reading poems about how they're sure they're going to die any day now from a school shooting. Even though, as far as I can tell, New Hampshire has had zero school shootings ever. So anyway, the left says they're all afraid of school shootings being the worst threat besides climate change. And we have this, and, and it's kind of flying under under the radar. Next. Do we have time to take on the whole Cuomo and the NRA issue? Because I've been postponing this for weeks now. We got a few minutes. I'm gonna give I'm gonna give the the short and sweet story on Cuomo. But you want to talk about Cuomo too, right? Uh, <laughs> so Cuomo's great. I kind of don't want to because it might turn into four minutes of me yelling into. Good, the that's fine. So I mean, Cuomo is the gift that keeps giving. He is unlimited ammo for us, and I do love unlimited ammo. He's just amazing. He's been. I think this is recent, the NRA, right? This was just reported, I think, pretty recently, but I could be wrong. Cuomo kind of learned that the NRA had said in in some court documents that the insurance they have called the carry guard insurance, which is a a self-defense insurance, essentially. The NRA has an insurance, and and USCCA and a bunch of other companies have it, but the NRA is is the largest or second largest, maybe the USCCA. They have an insurance called carry guard, and you pay a few bucks a month, and if you should ever have to defend yourself with a firearm or maybe defend yourself with with your hands or or any weapon, I believe, they will either pay for the lawyers or supply the lawyer or reimburse you for the lawyer depending on on the exact program. That's what self-defense insurance is, and, and I believe millions of Americans have this this type of insurance from one company or another. Anyway, the NRA apparently said in one of these documents that 
in one of the, the court documents, I believe, that their primary or, or a big part of their funding for the NRA comes through this carry guard insurance program as opposed to donations, memberships, uh, other uh, corporate sponsors. So Cuomo kind of being a shark smelled blood in the water, which is natural, and, and now he's trying to take them out. What I read is that the insurance that underwrites the carry guard insurance program in New York is now being attacked by Cuomo and by the department. I have the department somewhere here. It's the department that oversees all the insurance, I suppose, in New York. And uh, they they kind of told him, told the NRA they have to cease and desist this program because because what Cuomo said, the quote from Cuomo or the department head, is that it's illegal to have an insurance program in New York State for committing a crime. Now this, I don't know how familiar you are with the with the self defense insurance programs. The big issue with these programs, some of these programs, I think most of these these insurance programs, they say specifically, if you committed a crime, like, like an offensive murder or an offensive shooting, they will not represent you. Some of these programs, I don't know about the carry guard, some of these programs will not represent you or will not reimburse your legal fees until after you are acquitted, until after all the trials totally declare you innocent, meaning it was a good defense, a good shoot, appropriate defense. So if you, if you are guilty, they certainly won't help you. And once you're guilty, they'll cut ties with you during the process. They won't, they won't pay for any of your legal fees. So this is actually totally the opposite of what Cuomo said, which is totally untrue. He said that they have to stop running this insurance program, and he told the underwriters of the insurance, so the insurance companies in New York that, that do this, that they, they can't do this anymore. It's illegal. And now the NRA is suing, is suing New York in federal courts. I believe the suit is New York versus NRA, and it's in a federal court. Now, for the, NR, for the NRA, that's NRA's funds, meaning they get from donations or however they get their money. That's not affecting me a lot. Plus, I don't care if the NRA goes away because they're bad than good. And we're going to get to that later. But New York, Cuomo and this department that oversees all the insurance and, and commerce in New York, who, who are their lawyers? They're probably paid for by taxpayers. So if this court, if this court case drags out for years in the federal court, this might be uh, – Another massive expenditure for taxpayers, which who cares at this point? I mean, it's trillions, right? We're paying uh, three trillion in taxes a year. So that's that. I'll, I'm gonna post a link, a few links, so you guys can get all the details because it, it's kind of complicated. It gets into the weeds technically about about the laws and, and how the insurance works in New York and, and what Cuomo did to them. But there's a very interesting fight between NRA and Cuomo in New York. So. Yeah, we could have a whole discussion about about whether the NRA is a positive, uh, a net positive or a net negative for gun rights, because they're the the compromise uh, firearms association. Of course, I've I've heard rumors, I've heard rumors that they have been writing the gun control bills going back decades. I think back to the '80s, maybe the GCA in 1986. They're really helping this legislation for for gun control, so that. People can get more afraid that they're going to lose all their guns, and then more people sign up for the NRA, and that's the cycle. They want people to get afraid and sign up for the NRA so we can help fight for your gun rights and all that BS. So I don't really care much about the NRA. I just thought it was interesting that Cuomo was using just a new way, just interesting, a new way to kind of attack the uh, gun rights in New York. So that's interesting. What else do we have to talk about? Peter Strzok. That's hilarious. Peter Strzok, the— uh, Disgraced FBI agent who's a, a scumbag who was apparently texting his mistress. It was his mistress, right? Yeah, mistress. Yeah, so he had a wife, and he was, he was cheating with some girl in the FBI that worked with him, Lisa Page. I believe. And they were cheating, and some of the texts they sent were, were dirty, but also dirty in the sense like saying something about Trump or we, we are in the FBI, and we have to protect the nation from Trump. We can't let him win, something like that. Anyway, he was finally fired after, I think, months or, I guess, years now uh, of the proceedings. He was finally fired from the FBI, and, and uh, he— created a GoFundMe to help pay for his legal fees. Just insane. He's actually got, in the last I checked before the show, over $400,000 people donated to him. Now, I don't know if it's people who are lefties who hate Trump and they're motivated to give their hard-earned money to Peter Strzok for his legal fees, or it's it's kind of bigger donors, people, uh, Clintons or uh, DNC, people who have more money. That would make more sense. But I just thought it was hilarious. He's at... Four hundred twenty-four thousand two hundred and seventy-three out of five hundred thousand. Jeez, that's that's incredible. <laughs> Eleven thousand forty-eight contributors, three days. That I don't I don't understand that. 
Jeez, what else did we have to talk about? I have so much other stuff here, but he's he's not on too, and and like. Well, we uh, we did find out uh, a few days ago that Gary Johnson's going to be running for uh, governor of New Mexico. Senate, Senate, uh, Senate U.S. Sorry. Senate. Yep, U.S. Senate. I think I mentioned that. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited about it. I think it could be fantastic. He has a lot of support in New Mexico. This could be one of the great races for the libertarians. I think the libertarians nationally could do pretty well. But again, like as I've said on the show before, and I've written articles about it as well, I believe, I, I've kind of given up on the country. So if Gary Johnson gets into the U.S. Senate, it'll be a fantastic moral victory. It'll be something symbolically. Even one senator probably can't do too much, as we see with, with Rand Paul trying to do what he can to maintain what semblance of liberty we still have remaining in the U.S. But I'm, I'm going to be focused more on New Hampshire, to be honest, and, and that's why I moved here. I'm here now, and I'm fighting in New Hampshire, and we have some serious candidates. Whoever is the nominee between Aaron Day and Gillette Jarvis, whoever is the Libertarian Party nominee for New Hampshire governor, is going to be fantastic and do very, very well against Sununu. And I, I think I've mentioned this, and, and I want to save a lot of this for future shows because we still have another uh, two, three months of— yeah, three months just about before the election, and, and we're going to have 12 more episodes, I suppose, and we're going to get on some Libertarian candidates and maybe some Republicans, some people who know a lot more than I do about the New Hampshire Republican Party and Democrat Party and Libertarian Party, and they're going to explain to a lot of voters, maybe maybe 500,000 voters who, who are generally Republican voters here in New Hampshire, we're going to have some, some great guests explain from the inside of the Republican Party why they are just not the party of freedom anymore. As, as someone mentioned to me the other day, and, and Aaron Day's mentioned this a few times now, I believe, in the debates, under the, the last two years, we had a total Republican control, a trifecta, total control of the New Hampshire government. The governor, Sununu, since 2016, the House, pretty big majority for Republicans, I believe, the Senate, majority Republican, the Executive Council's majority Republican, all four branches of our government, because we have four here, by the way, not three. We have a an, an fourth branch that sits just under the governor called the Executive Council. Okay. So all four branches, the House, the Senate, the EC, and the governorship, have been Republican for two years. Before that, it actually wasn't. The governor was, was Hassan, the Democrat. In the last two years, if, if you ask Aaron and a bunch of other libertarians, in the last two years, this legislative session, we've lost more freedoms than in any other session we can remember. We were expanding Medicaid, re-expanding Medicaid, giving, giving welfare to more and more people, Increasing the debt, increasing the spending. The spending in the state for education keeps going up. We're spending more on education, even though the enrollment, the overall participation is down because people are leaving to homeschool and private school, of course, because you know that's what the government makes us do because their schools are horrible. Because the private sector does everything better, cheaper, faster. Absolutely, and especially with government, not only not only is it is the the product bad when the government supplies education, but it's indoctrinating, and people like me don't want our kids indoctrinated. So. There are a lot of issues in New Hampshire, and we're going to get on some great guests that explain that the New Hampshire Republican Party is so anti-freedom, possibly in a lot of ways worse than the Democrat Party. Now, here's a phenomenon that someone, a conservative before the the presidential election of 2016, someone mentioned to me that there, there's a certain phenomenon that we could have had, in a sense, a worse outcome with Trump than under Clinton in the sense that the Republican House in the in the U.S. government and in the New Hampshire government, the House and Senate being Republican, they kind of posture and pretend they oppose when the executive, the governor or president, is Democrat. So under Obama, the Republicans all pretended they had spines in Congress, and they, they kept passing all these great bills and, and kept passing the repeal Obamacare bill because they knew it wouldn't get signed. So they kind of pretend they have a spine, but they don't really want to do it because they, they like this stuff. They like the authoritarian the authoritarian policies in new hampshire we have the same thing the republicans in the house and the senate may, maybe under hassan under a democrat they were seemed pretty good and at least they could oppose her and, and send out great emailers and send out great mailers and great campaign speeches and, and write great articles and give speeches about how they oppose the, the governor because the opposition is really good opposition is really really good for a politician like, like we're doing now you can go out there and complain about someone and yell about someone it, it, it's easy to do it's harder to do when you're in power, and now you know, the voters of New Hampshire gave the Republican Party full power of the New Hampshire government for two years. And we see the same thing in, in Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C., they've actually done some good things. It's mostly the same old crap. It's mostly the same old bad stuff, but a few good things that I've written about. 
have happened in the last two years in D.C., which is surprising because I expected it all to be bad. But in New Hampshire, it's it's been pretty much all bad besides for, for constitutional carry it, uh, two years ago, right when Sununu got into office. It's, it's been really, really bad. So we're going to go into the details with some guests who are now libertarians. As we know, a lot of the libertarians are Republicans who defected because they realized that Republicans do not support freedom, not in New Hampshire, and, and very few Republicans around the country support freedom. They're, they're as bad as Democrats and worse in some ways. Medicaid expansion, that was the Republicans. The Medicaid expansion being reauthorized just a few weeks ago. The Republican leadership, remember, they're the House and the Senate in New Hampshire are controlled by Republicans, meaning all the leadership positions, the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, the Senate leader, majority leader, they're Republicans. They set the rules for the House and the Senate. On Medicaid expansion a few weeks ago, when it was reauthorized to keep expanding Medicaid to, to more and more people, which is straight-up welfare, able-bodied people, it was reauthorized on a voice vote, on a voice, meaning no accountability. And or that it was so obvious that there were so few nays that, you know, you could do a voice vote. You don't even need a, a tally of the roll call. But what I think is the worst part is no accountability. If someone had said, hey, roll call, if someone had stood up there and gotten a few votes and gotten a roll call, we'd have on paper who voted yes, who voted no. And I'd be writing articles about every single person, especially Republicans in the House and Senate who voted for this. I'd be writing articles, working as hard as I could to get them out of the state government. But no accountability, so we don't know. I have some ideas of who are the bad ones, who are the authoritarians, but no accountability. So we're going to focus a lot between now and November. During this election season, we're going to have a lot of guests, and they're going to explain to us why we're no longer even trying. Because I have a few friends who are still trying to fix the Republican Party, and they can. They can run as a Republican. I have great libertarian friends who are running as Republicans in New Hampshire, and they can run in House races because there's 400 seats. If you're running for one House rep, their leadership, they don't have enough leadership to really care. They don't get involved. If you win your primary, you win the election, you win, even if you're a good Republican. They won't like you once they're in the House, but you, you can run. But as far as leadership, it can't be changed unless you have billions of dollars or some kind of power. You, you, you can't reform leadership of the, the old parties. They've had 150 years now, the Republican Party. They're only getting worse and worse. That's why we have more and more people coming over to the Libertarian Party almost every day. And also over the next few months, we're going to have on some people – who who oppose liberty? <laughs> That's a nice way of saying uh, lefties, fascists, socialists. But we're gonna have on some some of the opposition. We're gonna have some good discussions either right here or or via the the program. We're gonna get them live on a, a web chat interview, and we're gonna have some really good discussions on policy where we agree, we disagree. Maybe some good fiery debates. Hopefully, not too many punches being thrown. But we're gonna have some fantastic, interesting discussions over the next few months. So look forward to that. Anything else we have to discuss? I think we're just about to the end of the agenda. Awesome. I, I think that's that's all I have for now. Of course, like and share it. Let us know if you want if you want any specific topics spoken about from week to week. You want to tease some of our guests? Um. Well, I besides for for Ryan Rihanna, I don't know about any confirmed guests yet. I'm gonna try to get on the Libertarian candidates, all the candidates for the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire. I'm going to try to have them all on. I have some ideas, but I'm not going to say anything until I can confirm. I would like to get on a whole lot of fantastic guests. Who's that? That's all right. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll post about it once we know of a certain guest, for sure. So I'm about ready to close up. We're going to get over to the TV to watch Larry Sharp on Fox Business with Kennedy, which is awesome because she's hilarious and crazy and a libertarian. So by 8 p.m., there's that, and there's football that started at 7.30 and two games at 8 p.m., I believe. So go watch that. This is Elliot Axelman from Liberty Block saying goodnight. Check out libertyblock.com. Constantly writing articles. Wrote a few articles in the last few weeks. What's that? Patreon. Yeah, and I'll remind you again about the Patreon, and I'll try to remember to put the link as well. And again, I, I hate asking for any donations, but we make no money. We just do this because we love it, and this is, I think, what we could do best for Liberty. But if you feel so inclined, I'll drop the Patreon link there. Please donate. All your donations will go right to Michael, who's now our, our sound engineer, videographer, producer, cinematographer. And if we can get him to come up here as often as possible, he can do incredible things with all this audio equipment. So I'll put that link there too. Thank you very much. Have a great night. We will be here next Thursday evening. Actually, hopefully next Thursday evening. Um, if not two weeks Thursday evening, 7 p.m. But look out for us just about every Thursday evening, 7 p.m. Thank you very much and have a great night.
Hi, this is Elliot Axelman from the Liberty Block. If you like our video, hit like, share, and subscribe. Check us out on libertyblock.com. Always principled, always libertarian.